Okay, here in this video I will prove two uh, fundamental theorems about the convergences of different types of convergences of measurable functions uh, and they both theorems are uh, in relation to reversing uh, implications we established in the preceding video. Um, I'll explain myself by just giving you the, the statement of the theorem. So the first one says that if you have a sequence of measurable functions which converge to another function f in measure topology, then there is a subsequence or sequence of integers such that the subsequence of given functions converge to this function f almost everywhere. So, and that's, that's uh, the meaning of my previous statement that the theorem is sort of a reversal of implication we established in the previous video. In the previous video, we established that almost everywhere convergence implies measure, uh, convergence in measure, but not vice versa. In general, convergence in measure does not imply convergence almost everywhere. However, it doesn't imply it, but for a subsequence, in fact, it does. So, what it says is that, is that although you cannot in general expect a sequence converging in measure converge almost everywhere, you can always expect that there is a subsequence within such a sequence which does converge almost everywhere. Here's a proof. We just use this canonical standard abbreviation AN epsilon, which stands for this set. Because we have convergence in measure, we know that the limit of measures of such subsets is zero, and that is true for every positive epsilon. Now we do the following construction. We take epsilon being equal one on k, and now for such epsilon, this limit will be zero, which means there is a index n, which I will call n sub k, such that the measure of this subset a n sub k is less than 2 to the power negative k. Now, basing on that, I will introduce the subsets bn's, which are like so. Uh, a simple estimate tells us that the measure of these bn's is controlled by the individual measures of these a and k's, and that's the sum of the geometric progression, or in fact, the sum of the tail of the geometric progression, and if you sum it up, it will be something like this. It says less or equal, but in fact, but in fact it is just equal. Uh, we also observe that the sequence of B's, it's a decreasing sequence of subsets, uh, which means that if I consider the intersection of this sequence, the measure of this intersection will be the limit of measures of Bn's, which is controlled by this number. It's a vanishing sequence, that's why the measure of the intersection is simply zero. Now, the remaining part of the proof just shows us that if I take an element which is not in my set B, this set B, then we just have to interpret that, and that's the interpretation. It means that we have an element, sorry, we have an integer, index n, such that there is uh, such that for every k bigger than this n, we have x not in a n k 1 on k, and that's just a direct interpretation of something not in here. If we have an element not in B, it means that this element in 1 doesn't belong to one of these ones. That's what it said here. And something which doesn't belong to one of these ones means that it doesn't belong to any, to every of these ones, in fact. And that's what is said here and here. Now, if I interpret the... If I use the definition of the AN sets, this is just something like this, and uh, look what we see. We see that for an element x not in B, we have an index n such that after such index, this difference is controlled by 1 on k. By pushing in this inequality k to the infinity, we can do that, because by pushing that we will always be larger than n, we just see that the point x must be the point of convergence. So every x like that implies this or belongs to the subset of x or convergence subset of x or set of convergence points for the sequence fn 
to the function f. Uh, now if you reverse this, so the element if the element x is such that it doesn't belong here, so the element x is such that this subsequence doesn't converge to f, it means it will belong to the complement of b. Sorry, it means it will it will belong to the to b because it will be the negation of this statement, but the measure of b is zero, and that means that the points x where we don't have convergence of this subsequence. This set of points is in fact of measure zero. And that finishes the proof of the theorem the one on this slide. Second theorem is in relation of reversing the other implication we established previously. It says that if I have a sequence of functions which converge to another function almost everywhere, measurable sequence, then for every positive delta I can find a measurable subset. It's a sigma algebra, such that the complement of, the, of this measurable subset is of measure less than this given delta, and my sequence converge uniformly to my f on this smaller set E. So this is in relation to reversing this, uh, the implication from the uniform convergence to almost everywhere convergence. We know this in the previous video, that if sequence converge uniformly, it will also converge almost everywhere. Uh, but the reverse, the, sorry, the converse statement is not true. However, with this minor adjustment, it is in fact true. So if you, if you drop from your measure space a set of small measure, not zero measure, but small measure, then on the remaining part of your measure space, you will have uniform convergence. And that's the definition of the uniform convergence over some subset of your universal set. Now, here's the proof of that. Uh, we will use this notation again. Basing on this notation, I will introduce the sets Cn, Epsilon, which are just these unions. I will, I will observe that this is the decreasing sequence of subsets, so I can consider this intersection, I mean, I can consider this intersection in any circumstances, but for the decreasing sequence, it will have some interesting consequences. Now, what I will claim is this. If I have an element from this intersection, from the C epsilon, then I will just interpret this now. Then I have that for every n, uh, and for uh, there's a k bigger than this n, so for every n it must be here. And by interpreting what it means, being here, it means that we have some k larger than n, such that my x in here and that's what it said here. Now, being in this set, that's how we interpret that. It's a definition. This, this is just the definition of this set. And now what we see now is that, look what we see now. For an element x in this set C epsilon, uh, for every index n, there is an index after that, such that this inequality holds. This is a direct interpretation of point of divergence. It means that in the point O, at the point X, we don't have the convergence. Now, we originally start with the, started with the assumption that Fn converged to F almost everywhere. So, the collection of all points where we, sorry, collection of all points where we don't have convergence, such collection is of measure zero. The set C epsilon is a, according to this chain of implication, is a subset of that set. So we conclude, we conclude that the measure of this set is zero, and so we also conclude that the limit of these individual measures, due to sigma additivity of my original measure, is zero. Right. Now, given that, I can do my construction of this measurable set E, which will meet this requirement and which will meet this requirement is my construction a fixed delta positive now I choose a index n sub s with the property that measure of this set is less than delta on 2 to the power s this comes from the fact that this limit is zero so by putting here in the position of this epsilon 1 on s 
the limit of this thing will go to zero, so there will be an index here when this quantity is less than predefined small number. Now, basing on these sets now, I will construct the set E like this. It will be the complement of this countable union. It is almost immediate, it is, it is almost immediate that the complement of such E, which will be just this union, is of small measure, because the measure of this union is controlled by the measure of these individual C's, or C and S, and each of them individually controlled by this number. If you sum these numbers, it will be geometric progression, and the sum of this progression will be just delta. So this requirement is met automatically by the construction of my C and S subsets and the subset E. The other requirement is a little bit longer to justify, but still relatively easy. Let's just fix an epsilon, positive epsilon, and let's just fix uh, index S such that 1 on S less than this epsilon. Now, look what I say. I say that if I start with the element X in my set E, like this, it means that this element X doesn't belong to every of these C and S, in particular that C and S, which correspond to this number S we chose, in here, we chose here. So my X doesn't belong to this C and S, 1 on S, for this particular epsilon like this. If I interpret this statement, if I interpret this statement, that's how I have to interpret it, it means that for X doesn't belong to these subsets for every k bigger than this and s, and we're almost done. I draw your attention that this sequence n s is independent of my original x. It is constructed here, well before I chose my x. So I can now interpret this statement via the definition of this subset here. That's the interpretation. And now look what we just realized. This is the interpretation, and that's extra inequality which comes from here, in fact, from my choice of S. Look what we just realized. For positive epsilon, we found an index such that after this index, these differences in absolute value always less than epsilon, and that's actually true for every X like this. So in fact, I can write this because, like I said, this NS is independent of this X. This inequality can further be written like this. That's a supremum across all such x's of this difference will be less than epsilon. So for positive epsilon, we found an index such that after this index, this quantity, numerical quantity depending on k only, is less than epsilon. That is exactly the definition of this limit, and that's why we have uniform convergence over the set E.